Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to welcome Nitya Ramanathan from UCLA to Microsoft Research. Nitya received her BS from UC Berkeley in 1998 from the EECS department and is currently a doctoral student in the computer science department at UCLA at the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. Her research interests include the deployment of wireless sensing systems for environmental applications and the design of tools to improve the quality of data collected from these systems. In 2006, she deployed a wireless soil sensing system in a nice paddy, in a rice paddy, I'm sorry, <laughs> in Bangladesh as part of an investigation into the source of high levels of arsenic in the local groundwater. In June 2007, she was awarded the Switzer Environmental Fellowship for her contributions to environmental sensing. Uh, Nitya. Okay, thanks. thanks. So, the bulk of my thesis was focused on designing systems that would enable uh, scientists and other non-expert users to deploy embedded network sensing systems easily. And so over the deployments that I've done through the last five and a half years, what I found was the major challenges uh, to wi more wide-scale deployment was the quality of the data sets that were collected from these systems. So I designed fault two fault detection and diagnosis systems to address the problems that we found in the field. And so what do I mean by faults? There's many types of faults that could occur, but because I was working with scientists primarily, we focused on the end product. And this is uh, faults that impact the data set because that's what the scientists cared about. So these are faults that result in missing data points such as bad nodes or radio interference. This also means faults that lead to incorrect or confusing data such as aging or biofouled sensors or drifting sensors. And as you can see by a couple of representative deployments I have here, um, these, this high experience of high rate of faults is not uh, unique to our deployments, but everybody experiences high rates of these two types of faults. And these faults lead to incomplete data sets that are difficult to interpret for scientists. There's many sources of uncertainty that complicate fault detection and diagnosis. Uh, sensors are inextricably tied to harsh and unpredictable environments. For example, in the thousand, uh, X -scale thousand node X scale deployment done by Ohio, uh, rain, and wind, uh, rain and wind noise interfered with acoustic sensors. And these kinds of problems can't be predicted in advance, so scientists have to deal with this in the field. But what it means is that there's really no predictable fault free period. In addition, many of these deployments are done in environments that are previously unknown. So there's really no models of expected behavior or no understanding of the physical phenomena in advance. And the sensors are being deployed specifically to get more information on the environment. That coupled with the fact that we tend, we started using newer sensing hardware, we really don't know in advance, we don't know how to define in advance what to expect from these deployments. And what complicates the problem is that Low resource nodes and short lived deployments mean that we have less time, data, and resources with which to find and fix faults in these deployments. So the problem that I addressed in my thesis work was to detect and diagnose faults in the face of uncertainty. What's the scientist's solution to uncertainty? Well, primarily what we found in our experience was that uh, they do manual validation of questionable or faulty data using a physical sample that's analyzed in the lab or using a high fidelity sensor to verify the data that's being collected. The advantage of this approach is that scientists can use, on-site users can use context in detecting and diagnosing faults that a network cannot automatically sense on its own. And the reason we need this kind of on-site context is because often some data that may be faulty in one deployment is actually true data in another deployment. For example, uh, in a deployment that we did in Bangladesh, uh, we collected data from a nitrate sensor, from about 10 nitrate sensors. And this data is representative of what we got from most of those sensors. 
And initially, scientists thought the data was faulty, but they had extracted soil samples and verified that actually the data was reflective of just a very low concentration in the field, something that they hadn't known before because um, this was the first time that we were deploying nitrate sensors in the field. So using those results, we were able to recover 50% additional data from these sensors that otherwise would have been discarded. But as you can see by these pictures, taking actions in the field is not easy. It requires labor, and it's time intensive, and you get really dirty. So this is just a portion of the data that we collected from the 50 or so sensors we deployed in Bangladesh. And the red circles uh, cover data that was most likely faulty. I say most likely because it's hard to tell uh, in these environments because we know so little about them. But the idea here is just that there's such a high rate of faults. And when you're manually monitoring the data in the field, we were quickly overwhelmed. So the manual approach to monitoring data falls short when you have a network of larger than, say, 10 sensors. Definitely. In this case, because we don't have the model, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. And in fact, uh, one example of how that manifested was that because they had never deployed these types of chemical sensors that we had deployed during this deployment, I say deployment a lot, um, we, we discovered diurnal cycles in ammonium and nitrate and potentially chloride. And so these cycles could be really important in understanding why the arsenic is being mobilized at such high levels. But they had never found that before because physical sampling is very time intensive. So they would perhaps take one physical sample a week. That was what previous uh, experiments had done. So they had some sense of what the nitrate level was at a certain time of day, but they had never tried to monitor over the course of one day. And so the, the discovery of these diurnal cycles, which hadn't been known before, led to completely changing how the hypothesis was structured around why the arsenic was mobilized. So just giving you an example for the fact that, yeah, we had no physical models of the phenomena before we went. And so actually, Amin sort of phrased it in a helpful way that in some ways, this work is really part of this first phase in a two-phase process where the systems that I designed were helping scientists to develop these models that they could then ideally use in subsequent deployments. Oh, so the solution that we designed was um, sort of leveraging the advantages of the scientist manual approach with traditional automated fault detection and diagnosis. So we design systems that efficiently focus a user's attention by suggesting actions that users can take in the field to fix and validate potential faults. So in order to design these user-centric systems, we had two main design goals. The first was to limit the burden on the user, excuse me, which user burden comes in the form of intensive uh, labeling of data sets or pre-configuration, as well as in the field, having we wanted to limit the amount that, of actions that the user had to take because taking actions in the field is so difficult. And the second design goal we had was transparency because, again, we were working primarily with scientists and other non-computer science users. So we wanted to design systems that would be familiar to the scientists and uh, easy for them to understand. And I'll give you an example of a non-transparent system. For example, a neural network, uh, this is just an image I grabbed off the web, takes a set of inputs, passes them through a complex set of logic, and then provides outputs. So in an area that's so highly uncertain, if I don't understand this logic, it's difficult for me to trust the output. And if I determine through perhaps external validation that the output is wrong, there's not much I can do to correct the system in the field. It's difficult for me as a non-expert user to uh, update this neural network or incorporate the knowledge that I may have newly gained. So what we focused on doing was uh, utilizing mechanisms that are visible to the user and easy to understand and used only a small number of metrics in order to characterize system health to simplify the overall system reasoning. So in my thesis work, I designed two user-centric systems. The first is sympathy, which focuses on detecting and diagnosing network faults. And the way sympathy works is it periodically collects a set, small set of metrics from each node in the network and analyzes these metrics using a decision tree that we designed based on our experience and analysis of faults in the field. 
And when we tried to, sympathy worked well to manage network health, but when we tried to apply the static approach to monitoring uh, data faults, what we found was that because sensors are so tied to the environment, data is different in each environment. And so the static approach didn't work in these dynamic uh, situations. So the decision trees, and it's based on a priori understanding of the network. But I mean, of course, the network is impacted by the environment, but not as much as the environmental data. You know, so that is one approach, but even learning a decision tree, the assumption there is that you have data that you could train a model with, that you have data in advance before you go into the field to train a model with, or the assumption is that I can go to the field and as I'm collecting data, I can train the model online. But there's all sorts of assumptions that are, are embedded there, that perhaps my data is not faulty in this initial training period, or that I have some assumptions on the spatial relationships that may exist, in order to train this model. And so we actually tried to do something similar. We tried to first start with sympathies approach and then try to have a more dynamic decision tree approach in the field to apply to data faults. And both times what we found ultimately was that when, because we would be working side by side with scientists, that they didn't trust this decision tree notion or even a, a machine learning algorithm that they couldn't understand but what we did find is that um, they could point to data in the field. And just based on their own domain expertise, based on their past experience, based on what they were observing in the field, based on what they knew of this context, they could say, OK, this data I trust, and this data I don't trust. So that was sort of the, we, we worked from there to design a system that could incorporate that kind of that feedback. Domain it is, I mean, it's domain dependent because it assumes that the scientist knows something about the environment. But it's different to say, for, it's different for a scientist to point to data and say, I trust this data, versus having to define an equation or assign a threshold or even specify nodes in a decision tree in advance that say, OK, I know that if I see this event, then I think this is the problem. It's, it requires a, a different level of detail of knowledge in the environment. So we focus primarily on se soil sensing, just because, um, well, one, I became really interested in those deployments through the Bangladesh experiment, but also because soil sensing is one of the more challenging environments to study, both for the scientists as well as for, um, for systems engineers, because there's so little that's known about soils right now. whereas more uh, like temperature, humidity, microclimate, uh, even acoustic, we, ha we have a lot more knowledge about those environments. So as you mentioned before, like physical models exist to model the expected behavior. And the sensors are really reliable in those areas. Like a temperature sensor never breaks. <laughs> and so soil sensing was sort of a good area for us just because the sensors are really new and there's very little known about the environment. Uh, okay, so confidence was the second system that we designed, and uh, it was based on all this experience that I'm talking about, and it was a much more dynamic system. And the way confidence works is uh, sensors will periodically send data to a centralized base station, and this base station will extract features from the sensor data and map it to a low dimensional feature space uh, where similar sensor network and data group together. And this feature space ultimately makes it easy for users to provide feedback back to the system, as well as employ really simple mechanisms to detect and diagnose faults. So I'll, I'll focus most of my talk on confidence. Uh, the contributions of our work are for sympathy, which includes three system health metrics, a decision tree to diagnose faults, and a localization algorithm to reduce fault notifications. Uh, the second is confidence, which includes three sensor data features and a feature space where similar sensor and network data group together. Uh, the third is also related to confidence, which includes dynamic algorithms, which classify faults and can be updated with user feedback online. And finally, an implementation and evaluation of both of these systems um, in real-world deployments. So 
I'll, um, I sort of talked about that, so I'm going to skip existing techniques. I can go into related work in more detail at the end if anybody's interested. So I'll talk really briefly about our first attempt to design a user-centric system, Sympathy. So Sympathy, as I mentioned, focused on network faults. And the main insight for this system was that the amount of data that's collected at the sink is related to the existence of failures in the system. And this insight just uh, allowed us to greatly simplify the system design to uh, just focusing on tracking data flow. So in order to determine has a failure happened, Sympathy simplifies this question to just determining is data lost from any node or component. So it just tracks data flow at the sink for each node and component in the network. And if insufficient data has been received, then it determines that there's a failure. And it wants to know what failure happened. So it tries to figure out, OK, why was the data lost? And so um, using our insight, we were able to uh, just collect a small number of metrics that just track data flow in the network. And we used, because we had a small number of metrics, we had a really simple decision tree in order to analyze these metrics in order to determine why was the data lost. Did the node crash? Did the node reboot? Uh, can, is a node not in communication with any neighbors? These are some examples of uh, diagnoses that Sympathy comes up with. But when we started deploying Sympathy in the field, what we found was that not all failures were equally important. And so we wanted to determine, OK, is this failure important? Is it worthy of the user's attention? So uh, it finally looks at where was the data lost. So it uses a simple localization algorithm that will localize a failure to three possible places. The first place is to the node itself. The second place is to the path. And the third is to the sink. So users only have to focus on failures that are localized to the node itself. And so what we found in our evaluation, this is just a graph of simulation results. And we found that using this localization algorithm, it reduced the overall failure notifications by about 50%. This graph is a scatter plot of, um, there's a point on there for each simulation we ran. So it's about 100 points. And the y-axis is the number of primary failures, meaning the number of failures that the user has to pay attention to. And the x-axis is the total number of overall failures uh, that the user is notified of. And this line here is the 50% line. So all points below that uh, had even a greater reduction than 50% of overall failure notifications. I'll skip that. So Sympathy has served as inspiration for a number of debugging systems, a new sensing architecture, and a new protocol evaluation metric. OK, so I'm going to talk now about confidence. We designed a Sympathy-like approach, as I mentioned, to address data faults. And what we found was that when we used it in the field, we were forced into this process of trying to modify the thresholds in the field based on the data that we had collected. So in a given field, uh, maybe sensors were behaving a certain way, and we had to try to fine tune the thresholds in the decision tree in order to adjust to this new environment. And this approach is never easy to do, as anybody who's tried to modify thresholds during a deployment knows. But we built on the successes in Sympathy, primarily this collection of a small number of metrics and the localization algorithm in order to design a new system to manage both sensor and network health. So we designed Confidence, which is a, a more dynamic system that adapts to new environments. And our primary goal in designing Confidence was to come up with a simple system that worked with minimal input from the user. And this system is based on two major insights. The first is that uh, it's possible to define a feature space that tends to group nodes and sensors with similar fault states. Uh, this is a plot of data collected from one of our soil deployments at the James Reserve. Excuse me. It's a two-dimensional feature space. And um, what we see is that data with similar types that was resolved by similar types of actions groups together in this feature space. But so this first insight helps us simplify fault detection, but it doesn't help us sufficiently simplify fault diagnosis. But our second insight was that actually regularly spaced regions in the space sufficiently identify groupings with a little bit of input from the user. So I'll give you a brief overview of the system, and then I'll just talk in a little bit of detail on each of the components. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, this is just a two. This is a two-dimensional, okay. but and we use three. Yeah. yeah. So not sufficient in terms of, their, it's of course not always correct, but what we found was that um, with a little bit of user feedback, they worked well enough for scientists. And so an example of user feedback was simply that, uh, take this point, for example, which is not quite in this region, it's probably in the region above. Um, a user could, looking at getting a visualization of the feature space, it was easy for users to say, okay, I know that, for example, these sensors that needed to be replaced, these were carbon dioxide sensors, and uh, one temperature sensor. And so the user could look at this space and say, okay, I know that this is also a CO2 sensor and it's pretty close to these sensors, so I'm gonna update the label for this point to also say that this sensor should be replaced. And in the real case, right, you have this uh, Okay, that's a good question. So in this instance, it was distinguished because they were just different types of sensors. So these were CO2 and temperature sensors that needed to be replaced, and these were PAR sensors right here, uh, light sensors. And so um, I'll give you another example. What was going on here was these light sensors. Uh, this axis was the gradient, so it was just the rate of change of sensor data. And so the PAR data for, from two of three of the ten nodes had really high gradients, all the way almost up to this part, this edge of the feature space. And so um, confidence initially labeled it as faulty and needing to be replaced like these sensors in this region. So we went out to the field and we looked at the PAR sensors. And what we found was actually that it was really windy that day. And so uh, the tree, there were two of the nodes, the light nodes were covered by trees sort of next to them. And so because it was windy, the branches were blowing over the PAR, data, PAR sensors. And so it appeared like the sensors had really high rates of change, much higher than the rest of the PAR data that was down here. And so uh, we were able to just add one label to the space that said, okay, we went and took a physical observation and actually the PAR data is okay. So we specified from nodes three through five of PAR data that land in this region, we know it's okay. So subsequent data from those nodes did not trigger further fault notifications. It's, I'm going to get into detail, but these are two features so that we gradient? used in our feature space. So this one's gradient, and I think this one is distance from what we call distance from the linear detection range, which is essentially uh, each, most sensors have a high confidence range and then like a lower confidence range. And you can get this from the data sheet, you can get it through the calibration process, you can get it um, just from domain knowledge. For example, I know that humidity is never below 0%. So there's many ways to specify these ranges. Um, and so actually it's a three-dimensional space, but I just show, I'm showing two dimensions here. Okay. This is really the main idea behind the system, so. What would be the third dimension? Uh, so our, our three features are gradient, distance from the linear detection range, and distance from the nonlinear detection range. So linear detection range was the high confidence and the nonlinear is the lower confidence but still operational. Usually what that means is just that the, data, the sensor can distinguish between differences in concentration but can't necessarily give the same uh, precision as it can in the high confidence range. Okay. And oh, well, you know, I'll just mention this right now since we got into kind of detail, that there is two feature spaces. One is a feature space for sensor health and then the second feature space is for network health. And so the network health feature space is used to detect and diagnose network faults, but works identically to this. Uh, okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about the feature space in the system overview. Uh, the feature space is designed such that good data clusters close to the origin of the feature space and faulty data clusters far away from the origin. And finally, that data with similar actions cluster close together. And so we've specified and selected features based on these criteria. So given that, uh, given that feature space then, fault detection it consists of drawing a dynamic threshold in the space to separate good data and faulty data, and fault diagnosis consists of coming up with these regions in the space that will approximately group similar data together. <coughs> 
And the second advantage of using a feature space like this is that we get data visualization or decision support. So as I mentioned before in this previous graph, I could look at this PAR data and I could say, well, initially confidence may have told me to replace the sensor, but I know that, OK, all the PAR data from a couple of sensors are grouping together in this location. So it gives me some insight into what is possibly wrong. So the feature space gives us um, simplifies detection and diagnosis, and it also gives us decision support. And both of these provide, suggest actions that the user can take in the field to find and fix potential sensor and network faults. Oops. And the final component is the feature space makes it easy to incorporate user feedback in real time. So I'll talk a little about how we selected features. <coughs> and I'll use the gradient feature as an example. Uh, so essentially, the gradient is just the change in value over the change in time for two subsequent points. And um, in order to come up with the features to define the space, we start with a, a set of features that are commonly used by scientists to detect and diagnose faults. And again, that was because ultimately we wanted the system to be familiar to scientists. And then we had four guiding principles. The first is that as the feature value increases, the uh, likelihood that the sensor is faulty should also increase. This gives us the first two properties of the feature space that good data group close to the origin and faulty data group far away from the origin. The second criteria is that features should be numerically quantifiable so we can actually map the data to a space. The third is um, what I call independent but uh, it's kind of a misnomer but just this notion that each feature should introduce a unique detection or diagnosis capability in, uh, for the sensors. And fourth, the feature should be verifiable, meaning that we tried to stay away from features that were difficult for the scientists to immediately calculate on their own. And one example of that is uh, uh, spatial redundancy. So one of the features that scientists do use to detect and diagnose faults is spatial redundancy. Do I see that these two neighboring sensors are similar, in which case I I'm more likely to trust the data. But what we found was that it was really difficult uh, for scientists to numerically quantify and to verify that value without the aid of uh, physical observations and uh, a model of the behavior or just other contextual information. So we left that feature out. But we came up using this criteria, we came up with a set of three features that led to a transparent system. So the features that we selected, um, the system health features we selected to define the uh, network health space uh, are node deadness, application deadness, and congestion. And we just took these three features from sympathy. So I won't get into that. Um, but the environmental data features, I'll describe just a little bit. Uh, the first is gradient, as I mentioned. The second is the distance. Actually, you know, I've already talked about all these. So yeah, sure. Oh, man, that's, that was a mistake. That graph is. Anyways, I, I meant to put graph of real data there, but it's a, a random graph. Anyways, the, okay, so the distance from the LDR is just, um, like I said, the high confidence range for a sensor. So we can obtain that from the, data set, from the data sheet or from the calibration. And it consists of defining a range that the sensor operates well in. So we come up with a threshold. Let's say that this is concentration and this is time. So we define a threshold. Um, where data within this is considered to be high confidence. And so then uh, the distance from the LDR is essentially just how far below or above this range is the data. And the distance from NLDR is similar, but it's uh, the nonlinear detection range, so the range is just greater. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, that's something that I, I didn't get into last time I described this. We do. So for example, when sensors drift, then this linear detection range and the nonlinear detection range change, clearly. And th that's the definition of drift. And so uh, we have an input mechanism so that if a uh, scientist considers that a sensor is drifted, um, either because they've validated a concentration and found that the concentration is the sensor's reporting is correct, or they've done some kind of in situ calibration or taken the sensor out and recalibrated it, uh, they could anyway specify that 
this thresh this uh, threshold has changed. Right. Right. So it's true. Yeah. There's a couple of reasons we decided not to do that. So the first reason is that understanding those relationships assumes that we um, have a familiarity, familiarity of the environment that in all the deployments that I did, we didn't have in advance. So in our rice field in Bangladesh, for example, ammonium and nitrate were inversely related strongly. But when we came to uh, San Joaquin River and did another deployment with a different group of scientists, actually, they weren't related at all. So this is just to make the point that unless you know that relationship in advance, we can't specify it. Whereas temperature and humidity is this really common example and is generally true. We just don't have that knowledge in advance. But the other reason is also um, it's difficult to specify that kind of relationship in a numerically quantifiable way. So going back to the spatial redundancy feature that I had mentioned, um, it's kind of similar to what you're talking about, where ideally you'd be able to say, well, seven sensors are verifying the data from this one sensor, so I'm much more likely to trust it. But it was really difficult to come up with a meaningful value to map this kind of a feature to. So uh, let me give you an example because I'm not making sense. If I have 100 temperature sensors, then if I have two temperature sensors verifying my one sensor, perhaps it's not that interesting. Whereas if I only have four sensors deployed and two of the sensors are verifying an a third sensor, then it, it, it's possibly much more significant. But it was really difficult to map a feature across multiple deployments for spatial redundancy. And similarly to this, looking at uh, relationships between multiple data, it, it's kind of a similar argument to looking at relationships between multiple of the same types of sensors. It's just really difficult to quantify it. OK, so now that we have this feature space, uh, we wanted to come up with a way to detect faults. So we came up, we wanted to be able to define a threshold in this feature space to separate faulty and non-faulty data. And so we, we found that the feature space, uh, I mean, we designed this feature space such that faulty data would cluster far from the origin and non-faulty data would cluster close to the origin. Um, so what we wanted to use was a simple distance metric in the feature space in order to separate the data. So we decided on using you, you, the Euclidean distance of a feature feature vector from the origin in order to separate faulty and non-faulty data. But in order to use Euclidean distance, we had to scale each feature such that no individual feature overwhelmed the distance calculation. So what we did was uh, we mapped features such that a value of 0 was good and a value of 10 was considered faulty. And the advantage to this approach was that data featured values could fall outside of 10, but that as long as these two held, we, we found that we got a, a reasonable mapping into the feature space. So there was no need to precisely define good or bad as long as these two, uh, these two rules held. And so many scaling functions to map features to the space would work, but um, we chose one scaling function based on our experience uh, with the data and the features. And um, so essentially what our scaling function was was we began, with, we began with the notion that we care a lot more about changes in small changes in value when the feature was small. Let's take the node deadness feature, which is essentially how long is the time that's elapsed since any node in the network has heard from a given node. And so if I haven't heard from a node between 30 and 60 seconds, I care a lot more about that than if I haven't heard from the node for 2,000 and 2,030 seconds. So we took the log of the feature value first, and so this compressed the L smaller changes in uh, large values much more. And then we found, though, that this still didn't map the feature values such that they fell between, it felt mapped to 0 and 10. So then we additionally would divide each feature value by a sensor and feature specific constant s. And so I'll talk more about that in the evaluation, but 
what we found was that because the units for most of these features were the same, that the same scaling constant actually worked for most of our sensors and features. And we validated this for over 20 types of sensors. OK, so once we have the feature scaling in this feature space, how do we then detect faults? We wanted to come up with a dynamic threshold that would uh, dynamically, uh, that would adapt to different environments. So we begin by taking each feature vector's distance from the origin. And we essentially want to detect outliers, so feature vectors that are anomalously far from the origin. So we modeled the distances of each feature vector, assuming a normal distribution. So then we just discarded any feature vector that was greater than one mean plus two times two standard, devi two standard deviations above the mean from the origin. And we updated these parameters only with data that were considered good, meaning data that fell within this threshold. Um, so we could have used other distributions, of course. Um, for example, one system uses a Chebyshev inequality in order to come up with a dynamic threshold in this space, which doesn't restrict the data to any given distribution. But in our experience, this has worked reasonably well. And a mean and standard deviation are very familiar to scientists. So we have maintained this. But then in order to update the parameters, we initially need some bootstrap. We need some way to bootstrap the parameters. So we come up with a static threshold in the space that we assign for a short, brief period of time in the beginning of the deployment. And we assume that all data within this threshold are good. And so we use all of those data to, in order to update the mean and standard deviation parameters. And we found that in, in practice, as long as more than 50% of the faulty data during this bootstrapping period is excuse me, outside of the static threshold, then the threshold converges to the correct value. So in order to diagnose faults, then, once we've come up with this dynamic threshold, in order to diagnose faults, we wanted to divide the region up in order to identify these similar clusters of data. And so we begin with um, ideas similar to user-driven segmentation, which relies on domain expertise to um, domain expertise regarding the importance of each subregion in the space. So uh, when confidence is initialized, the user initializes each region with an action that they think will address the data in that space. And that action isn't always correct, of course. So <laughs> this is similar to, for example, our PAR example, where the gradient of the, PAR, the light data was uh, a lot higher than most of the other good data. So in that instance, the user can incorporate feedback into this space and label this region as, for example, data from this PAR sensor is not faulty. And then that label is generalized to all data that fall into this region. So the advantage here is just that it minimizes the burden on the user. The user just has to label one point, and then the, that label is applied to all similar points in the region. And so this notion is, we call it outcome-based feedback. And it greatly simplifies uh, the it, it makes it a lot easier for users to incorporate feedback into the system. Instead of having users modify thresholds or change decision tree structures, instead they just have to point to data and say, this data is good, or this data was resolved by this action. And then the system is able to generalize that label to all similar types of data in the field, or in the feature space. So are there any questions on the design. If not, I was going to talk about, a little about the evaluation. That's a good question. So there, I mean, there is a way to initialize the space with labels and even a threshold um, from a previous experiment. But so far, we haven't had any reason to use that feature only because each deployment has been so different. And that's part of this learning process that um, I think the system does help with, which is that slowly, if you, do, if you start doing enough deployments in one field, for example, perhaps you do use this, use confidence as a way to train a behavioral model or uh, to define expected behavior. So yes, this is a short answer. <laughs> 
No, no, that's it, it, so we're actually working on that right now. But r what uh, this, the user gets right now is just um, a list of each region and the points that are associated with that region, and the sense like the sensor, the timestamp, and the value. And it, it just stores like the last I think twenty points in each region. And because we have a three-dimensional space, and each dimension is divided into three regions, it's uh, twenty-seven regions, and so. Uh, it's 27 times about 20, you get about 540 points. And it's just listed out in a file. And so then the user says, okay, this point is good it, through a command line interface. And we're actually using MSTAR, so we just use, uh, I think it's like a status device <laughs> to update it. Okay, that's another good question. So, no, it doesn't. For example, uh, acoustic data. I, I, I don't think gradient would work very well for acoustic data, I'm guessing. Right. Um, and image data is another example. So actually image data, we, I was talking to somebody in Vision about this and actually if you consider a data point to be an image and then you compare two subsequent images, it might actually be a reasonable feature to use for a video stream. But that's separate. We haven't explored it. Um, so right now, this I, I would be able to classify the sensors that this works well for as those that are based on like diffusion type phenomena. So in the air, uh, in the soil, those types of environments. It's just a time gradient. No. And again, the reason we didn't do that is kind of the spatial redundancy idea because the sensor under the rock that Deborah used to talk about. like. We encountered that all the time in the field. So one, one temperature sensor is under a rock, another temperature sensor is one inch away, but out in the sun. It's just so difficult to define a spatial gradient that was usable. We, I say this because we really, really tried. Because <laughs> it, it's really tempting. And we finally just abandoned it. So, um, I'll, okay, there's, I'll give you two examples. One in James Reserve, where they've got 130 sensors in the soil, soil as well as right above the soil. Um, they are taking this data. So the data are like CO2, temperature, humidity, uh, soil moisture, pressure. Um, we have recently deployed a couple of, about 10 nitrate sensors. But those sensors are just, chemical sensors are really hard to use because they require calibration. Calibrating one sensor takes like two to three hours if you do it right. And then you get it in the ground and then it has to be recalibrated once every two to four weeks. It's just a nightmare. Um, but, oh, okay, so the scientists are taking this data and they're feeding it into uh, a carbon cycle model. And I don't fully understand it. Actually, Eric, one of the scientists tried to explain this to me several times, but um, I just I haven't spent the time to read about it. But my very gross understanding is just trying to understand how carbon cycles between underground and above ground. And so that's one example. So they're taking all this data and feeding it into this model of the phenomena. And then in Bangladesh, for example, um, we were working with a group of scientists from MIT and EPFL who we're trying to understand why the arsenic is so high in the groundwater. And so they were taking, we had deployed 50 chemical sensors, and they were taking that data and trying to feed it into um, data that they had been focusing on, which was primarily hydrological. So looking at water pressure um, and water level changes underground. So they were trying to take this chemical picture that we were providing them and correlate it with the hydrological picture that they had been collecting over the last 10 years. And so they were trying to see how can we come up with a story, which was a very qualitative story, to explain these chemical results in addition to the hydrological results. So because they knew so little about the environment, they didn't have a mathematical model the way that the people at James Reserve have. But instead it was more of a qualitative picture, like, well, I see that pH increases and I see that ammonium is cycling daily. This could be caused by changes in the oxygen level. And it's sort of 
trying to come up with a story like that in a narrative to explain these data because they weren't even close to coming up with a mathematical model. A fault label, yeah. And actually, so we, we found that actually localization was not meaningful for sensor faults, but we continue to use the fault localization in our network faults. So in the network, because there's a separate feature space for network faults, what, one of the things that I liked about this work was just that we were able to apply the same methodology to both sensor faults as well as network faults. But the one main difference is that we do continue to use that localization that I talked about with sympathy in the network space but not in the sensor space. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll talk briefly about our evaluation. So ultimately what we wanted to know is, excuse me, how well does confidence operate in different environments? Because does it require a lot of domain expertise? Does it require a lot of training? Or is it a dynamic enough system that can operate well with minimal user feedback in applied to different in deployments. So we had a three-part performance hypothesis. The first was that the system correctly detects and diagnoses at least 90% of all data in a wide range of deployment scenarios. The second part was that incorporating outcome-based feedback did lead to improved system accuracy. And the third part was that confidence performs better than common thresholding techniques with less burden on the user. And so for our methodology, the primary performance metric that we used was the fraction of non-faulty and faulty data that is correctly detected and diagnosed for each of the deployment scenarios we came up with, that we uh, encountered. And our evaluation was in multiple different contexts. So we injected faults in real sensors as well as in simulation. We used real-world deployments as well as simulation and uh, replayed data sets from past deployments. And we also uh, tested confidence performance with a wide range of parameter settings in order to understand if the system wasn't perfectly tuned to the environment, how well does it still work? So before I get into some of the graphs, uh, one quick note about ground truth, because when you're detecting and diagnosing faults, you have to know what is the right answer in order to determine how accurate did the system perform. But in the environments that we were working in, there really was no notion of ground truth. So there was no concrete notion of what is correct and what's not correct. Versus in simulation, when I inject a fault, I know what type of fault I injected, I know when I injected it, and I know what the cause was. So for our exploratory deployments where we evaluate confidence, our notion of ground truth is based on manual analysis of the domain experts of the data. It's based on physical sample analysis that we did by extracting soil samples and analyzing them in a lab. And it's also based on pre- and post-deployment analysis of the sensors, primarily through calibrating them. So I used two main deployments, uh, Bangladesh, which was a replayed, or for the replayed data sets in order to evaluate parameter robustness. So these two data sets are taken from Bangladesh. And uh, for each of these deployments, I only took a subset of the data for which, I, for which we were pretty confident about which, faults, which data were faulty, which were not faulty, and what the causes were. So we take 33 sensors from Bangladesh and 130 sensors from a deployment at James Reserve. And there's a total of about 15,000 points for Bangladesh and 35,000 for James Reserve. And what we found was that um, confidence meets the 90% performance constraints for detecting non-faulty data, faulty data, as well as diagnosing data. Oh, we, you know, we weren't, the, we had of the 4,000 points that were faulty, we didn't know for sure why they were faulty. So I actually didn't evaluate the fault diagnosis for James Reserve. Um, okay. Well, we knew how many points were faulty based on uh, working with the scientists. So they said, okay, we think, the, we don't believe these points. But that's 4,000 points. Yeah. No, sorry. The second was just what, what caused the fault. Uh, yeah, I didn't describe that well. Uh, 
So it's faulty. What was the diagnosis? Why, meaning, why did they go wrong? And that is one of the hardest questions to answer, actually, in all of our deployments, is why did this fault happen? So the point here is just that without user feedback, the system did correctly detect and diagnose 90% of the data, which we had come up with as a, a target, a performance target. Um, unless anybody's interested, I think I'm going to skip the two graphs on the different parameter evaluation that we did. But speak up if you'd like me to get into it. OK, I'll, I'm just going to skip these two then. Uh, OK, this is kind of interesting. So we also evaluated performance in simulation, comparing confidence to sympathy, which was our past fault detection and diagnosis system for network faults. So we had a simulation. We injected a fail stop into a random node of the network. And we evaluated how long and how accurately did each system detect the fault, meaning how many false positives did the system notify the user of. And so uh, I, I don't have that graph on here, but confidence detects the faults more quickly than sympathy. But in addition, it also detects it with significantly lower false positives. So this is a histogram of the number of false positives for a simulation. Uh, sorry, uh, this is a histogram of how many simulations have this many false positives. So you can see that over half the sim we did about 24 total simulations. And over half of them, sympathy reports at least one false positive, where confidence only reports one false positive for two of the simulations and on down. So what I like about this graph and what I think is really interesting is that because confidence doesn't rely on static thresholds, instead it just uses a dynamic threshold in the feature space in order to identify faults. Whereas sympathy relied on static thresholds that we had programmed. And so, and we had find, like we used the simulations that were perfectly tuned for sympathy that we'd used in our original paper. But because uh, confidence doesn't rely on these static thresholds, it was actually able to detect and diagnose faults faster and more accurately. Yeah, uh, go ahead, I'm in. OK, that's a good question. I actually have a graph for that, not for networks, but for sensor data. Uh, oh, OK, great. So, uh, so I did an evaluation looking at your question. And I found that, OK, let, let me just describe this graph. Let's look at the top graph. This is fault detection accuracy, meaning how many, fault, how many of the faulty data points are correctly detected. And each of these bars corresponds to a subset of the features that were used. So this is all. This is two of them, two different, each possible permutation. And this is only using one. And so the linear detection range, this distance from LDR, is the most important feature in detecting faults. And this is kind of interesting, actually. So we found gradient to be the least important. This is just based on Bangladesh. And we also found similar results for the James Reserve data. This is fault diagnosis accuracy. But what I was going to say, and here's what's kind of interesting, is that in our actual deployments, uh, in one of our deployments at San Joaquin River, we found that gradient was needed in order to detect three of the four faults that actually occurred. So even though in these data sets gradient was the least important, in our actual deployment experience, gradient ended up being the most important. Was it the same sensor or was it different sensors in the same uh, They were the same sensors. So it was in nitrate and ammonium sensors. Well, this is a superset. So this includes about 12 different types of sensors. But uh, San Joaquin, we only use two of the 12 types of sensors we used here. Based on this graph, yes. Right. Which yes, that's true. Yes. No, that's not true. So 
I see what you're saying. It's, it's not that. It was just that the types of faults that occurred in San Joaquin were uh, totally different than anything we had seen in Bangladesh. And so it just so happened that the types of faults we saw were highlighted, highlighted by the gradient feature. Because I can get into a little more detail. Uh, I don't know if this is not interesting, but um, it was primarily the nitrate sensors that were faulty in the San Joaquin River. And we caught them because of these high gradients. So they were within the operating range, but they were just had high gradients. Um, whereas in Bangladesh, the nitrate sensors were below the nonlinear detection range, the data. So those were the, I'm sorry, they were within the nonlinear detection range, but below the linear detection. So that was the data that we thought was initially faulty, but because we'd extracted soil samples, we were able to validate that the data was actually just very low, concent the concentrations were just very low. Meaning it was the same sensor in both of these deployments, but two different features were needed. So that would work if we had a data set in advance that we trusted to be representative of the environment. So for example, perhaps I might use that next time I go back to Bangladesh and I deploy confidence. Perhaps I may weight the LDR more. But bar that scenario, there's really no way to know in advance which feature is going to be more important. Am I addressing what the point you're bringing up? OK. You could. On the first few countries. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So on the first deployment, what you're saying. And actually, even what you're saying, you could have something that's more adaptive based on, let's say, the first day of data collection. But the problem with that is that you're assuming that that day is going to be representative of the rest of your deployment. And you're assuming that there's perhaps no faults, or that the faults have a certain characteristic in that first day of deployment. And then. It changes over time, though, oh. because it's it relies. Well, sorry. For some sensors, it changes over time. For some sensors, it does not. But it's a property of the sensor. So, it's it, it, okay. It, it could be that. So, for example, for humidity, it would be that. It it would be. I don't expect to see data that is below 0% humidity. But excuse me, for the chemical sensors, and humidity sensors and temperature sensors don't tend to drift. So this LDR range stays the same. Whereas for the chemical sensors we used, because they require re -frequent, such frequent recalibration, because those sensors drift, this LDR range is not going to stay constant over time. Uh, had a question? Ah, um, so false negatives meaning the, whoops, the data that it, false that it misses in the network simulation or in the environmental data? Oh, this one. There were no, oh, right, there were no false negatives. So both systems eventually identified the fault correctly. It was more a question of how long did it take and how many false positives were reported in addition. OK. Uh, OK, so this graph, um, we took one deployment in James Reserve. We went out to the field, and uh, we deployed confidence with 100, this 130 sensor deployment. And what we found was that uh, by incorporating the outcome-based feedback that I had mentioned, we improved system accuracy. So the base case accuracy was 90% of detecting faults. And then initially, confidence reported all of this moisture data right here as being faulty um, because it was outside of the threshold. And so we went out and we took a soil sample, and we found that actually the soil moisture was just so low. In fact, there was no soil moisture. It was so dry that the soil sensors were just reporting negative values. And so uh, we just labeled all data from the soil moisture sensors as being OK. And this improved our accuracy to about 
And then similarly with PAR data, we went out to the field and just, as I mentioned before, looked at the sensors, found that PAR data in this region was also not faulty. Similarly with PAR data from this region, and that improved the accuracy to about 98% over this uh, two-day period. And, oh, uh-huh. Collecting what data? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. What would change? The raw data or the? You mean if you plotted features? I mean, if you plotted events in this feature space? I have not thought about mapping events to the feature space, because this feature space really is designed for raw data. Okay. Um, so you're asking what would happen if I tried to map events right. here? Yes. Especially for the gradient. I'd say primarily the gradient feature relies on some notion of continuity of sampling. Right. Well. Yes, you are relying on the continuity of the sensors. That's true. Which is sort of like an acoustic sensor, which is kind of why I was saying these features, I would argue, work well for diffusion type phenomena, which do have this notion of continuity. You have regular sampling, sampling, and there is a sort of constant notion, uh, continuity in the behavior of the operational range. Whereas acoustic sensors, you don't have that notion, and so I don't think acoustic data would work very well here. Is there another sensor you were thinking of, or another? Sure, or if you were detecting a car, yeah. But I would argue that in order to detect a car, you probably need, what are you using? Perhaps like a, the sensor itself might map well to this. But I, yeah, I agree. Events, I don't think, would work well to map to this. But you need a sensor to, you don't have a car detection sensor, right? You have like a, OK, so it is probably just a binary output. Yeah, no, that's true. That probably wouldn't work well either. Again, because it's not really measuring a diffusion type phenomena. Yeah. There is a, you can add a time uh, expiration to your label. So you can say, this label is valid for the next two days. And then perhaps that means that I want to be re-notified in two days, or that I just, that I know for sure that it's going to expire. Not just that, but any kind of updated, any, any labeling that the user would do requires out-of-band information, which is, that is the base assumption of this entire system, that we are deploying in environments that tend to be short-lived because they're exploratory. So we're exploring some new environment, so the deployment's short-lived, and that uh, the scientist is on-site. And so the argument behind the system is that why not leverage that scientist who is anyways there babysitting their deployment, why not leverage them and their out-of-band knowledge in the system in real time? And so, excuse me, this system is focused on being simple enough to make it easy for users to incorporate knowledge that they gain in the field. And it, that's really, I think, how it contrasts with most current work, which really is focused on being more autonomous. So how do we design the system that's going to require no input from the human? And here we're saying we have the human, we might as well use their expertise and their ability to observe context.
That's actually a really good point. So that's some of the, one of the things that I've been talking about with a couple of people is how would a system like this be useful in designing a deployment better? Like, especially in these exploratory deployments that tend to be really iterative. Like in San Joaquin, for example, it was just a, a three-day deployment. And so we were literally moving sensors around during the deployment saying, this sensor is giving us weird data. Confidence is triggering weird data from the sensor. We looked at the sensor. We couldn't figure it out. We validated the concentration. Let's just try moving it right next, to, next door and seeing maybe there was the equivalent of the sensor of a rock under a rock phenomena going on. So we're trying to think about how this can be used to iteratively design a deployment better as well. So you're saying assign thresholds individually to each of these features. Exactly. Yes. This is one data set, but actually in our other data sets, there's a lot more spread. And it, we have found that there, and that was actually one of the other reasons, I didn't get into this, but it's one of the other reasons why confidence's approach worked so much better than sympathy for data faults, was because for sympathy, let's say that I find that two features are, are indicators for a fault, I have to add another node in the decision tree. It's, it's a little bit more of a manual process, whereas here, it's so much easier to just update a label in this location of the feature space and just say, these two features are indicative. Just that you get this, yeah, yeah. This, so we have found that there are instances where there are faults that would occur up here, for example, where it is both of these features have that red light. Yeah. So let me see if I can remember. Uh, oh, you know, I can show you. Whoops. OK, so I didn't want you to have to make sense of this, but now we'll try. Uh, see that top graph in the second column on the top row? That data right there that is, um, had high gradient data, but it was also outside of the NLDR. So it would have fallen in this uh, portion right here. And that was actually indicative of um, uh, the, the fact that, we, that there was an irrigation event at that time. So meaning that the, the sensor just completely fell outside of its operating range, and it was changing really quickly. And so in that instance, it was because there was an irrigation event. And you can see that same characteristic in a couple of the other sensors. Is that? Oh, I can, I mean, I can talk about it. Because I, I wanted to, I want five minutes at the end just to talk about some of the work that I want to do next that's based on this. But, uh, OK. Um, Unless somebody else wants me to talk about it. Um, okay, really quickly, I'll just say about this that we also could just compared confidence to standard thresholding techniques that scientists use uh, to compare its performance. And we found that um, with just a little bit of feedback from the user, it performs a lot better. Okay, so this is one of the deployments that we did that I've mentioned a couple times. and. Um, I kind of like the graphs on this deployment, so I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, it was in the San Joaquin River that we did with the Civil Engineering Depl Department at UC Merced. They were trying to understand how agricultural runoff in the river impacts the riverbed. So we had deployed a set of sensors to shadow their sensors in the riverbed. We just deployed ammonium and nitrate. 
And in order to validate the data, oh, the other reason I like talking about this deployment was because it took a lot of work. So we validated the data. And um, that means that we took physical samples three or four times a day from each of the 14 sensors that we deployed and analyzed those in order to determine, is the data good or not? And so uh, this is an example of good data. I just grabbed two sensors. And we can see that the big shape here is the physical sample result. And the little shapes are the, con the concentrations reported by the sensor. So you can see that the sensor matches up pretty well with the physical concentrations. And then this is an example of a faulty sensor, where here's the physical concentration, and the sensor is up here. And what's interesting about this graph is, just as I had mentioned before, that the data looks like it's good because it falls within the linear detection range of the sensor. And it's sort of a, it's all kind of falling at the same, it's all pretty similar. But then you see these sudden jumps in the gradient. And that was how confidence identified the failure. And so we took a physical sample at that time and found that, yeah, actually, the sensor is faulty. Um, and then the only thing I'll talk about with our second deployment, real world deployment experience, is that uh, we actually injected faults into sensors. So we took sensors in this 130 sensor deployment, and we injected faults. And then we just saw, how long does it take confidence to identify the faults? Uh, I think we've talked about all this. So I'll just mention, OK, this is in conclusion. <laughs> and there's been a number of collaborators that I've worked with uh, in the Bangladesh deployment, as well as just the rest of the work that I've done. And um, so I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes, actually, about what I want to do next year. And so I'm going to be working with a group of scientists that are trying to reduce air pollution in India. And the project, it's called Project Surya. And the hypothesis is that uh, indoor air pollution is primarily caused by uh, uh, inefficient cookers, and that this indoor, indoor air pollution is actually escaping outdoors and is a significant contributor to outdoor air pollution. So what this project plans to do is stake out this four square kilometer region and take the several thousand households and replace the cookers that they're using with energy efficient cookers. Initially, it started out being solar cookers, but now they're exploring multiple options. Um, but the notion is that they want to instrument these villages with expensive towers that are positioned at the edges of the village, as well as deploy filters in each household. So in each of the several thousand households, they want to deploy a filter in order to quantify what is the indoor air pollution and how does that impact the outdoor air pollution? And how does this change when they replace the cookers? So um, these air filters will be able to sort of grossly quantify CO2 and soot. And the way the air filters work is they're just a pump that pumps air across the filter. And then based on a 1 to 10 grayscale of the color of the filter, the scientists can analyze what is the indoor air pollution. And so what we had proposed is using cell phones in order to make this data collection scalable. Because the filters have to re be replaced each day. And there's several thousand air filters. So initially, the scientists were planning to rely on the villagers who, uh, in each household to, docu to quantify the level of pollution on each of their filters. But clearly, this is highly subjective. And you don't know for sure that the person replaced the filter each day. And you don't get real-time feedback on this filter. So um, what we had suggested was having a cell phone use it to take an image of the filter. So it would take an image immediately before the filter was changed and immediately after the filter was changed. And then this image could be uh, uploaded in real time to a centralized base station. And the main advantage here is um, related to the data quality that we can see right now, which is that you then can automatically use the same algorithm to automatically evaluate the color of each filter in each household. So you get slightly more standardized view of the filter. And secondly, you can send notifications to users if the filter hasn't been changed, because you can determine that uh, either the image wasn't taken or that the image before and after the filter is the same. And then third, you can use the image of the new filter to calibrate the new reading. Because maybe some filters start out different colors than other filters. But if you have an initial image of the filter, you can compare that with the final image of the filter in order to uh, get a sense of 
the, the increased pollution level. So um, this is what I'm hoping to work on next year. So I'm kind of excited about that. And that's it. Oh. It's, so the sensors don't have a digital readout. It's just a, fil it's a filter. So in order to read the pollution level, you have to look at, using a color chart, you look at what is the color of the filter. And so I have a color chart that essentially has a gray scale from 1 to 10. And I compare that with the filter. So the idea was that if you can post the color chart right under the filter and take an image of both of these, then you could use simple analysis to. Yeah, because there's going to be different light levels. There's That's the hope, but I think that the light levels are still going to, like different, each household will have different light levels, and, and I, I actually don't know anything about images, but I imagine there's many differences across households. But this is kind of some of the challenges to address. Surya means sun. So it's, it was because they were going to initially use solar cookers. Surya is the, the sun god. So. <laughs> it's not the sun god? Wait, say it again? Oh, it just means sun. But I thought it was also the name of the sun god. Oh, okay. So my okay. Stick with my initial answer. Surya means sun. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thank you.